In this episode, I award Sanji the suave Ex Machina badge. Not only has he put a plan in motion to help save his crewmates, but he does it in the suavest way possible. He's so stylish. Welcome to the journey. Welcome to the crew. We think we're pretty funny, and we hope that you will too. This is the opening song to season two. It's where the journey really starts because we've made it out of East Blue. We've got our snacks and we've got our friends. Now it's time to discuss the anime that never ends. Yeah! Start the show! Hello, fellow adventurers of the Grand Line, and welcome to King of the What Now? New Knee! <laughs> We're a podcast, and I'm your Captain Joel. We discuss One Piece, usually the anime, sometimes the manga, uh, when appropriate. Uh, we've been going for a little while now, and I'm a longtime fan. Also, I'm a crocodile that has a banana growing on his head. I'm a uh, Curtis. I'm a One Piece novice, and I am a banana with a crocodile growing out of me. I don't like you. <laughs> Our biologies are too thoughts. different. I'm a banana. <laughs> And I'm Kat. I'm a zoologist here studying the difference. And, oi, crikey, would you get a load of this one? He's a big boy with the big choppy bits. I can't do an Australian accent. I'm oh, sorry. she's a beaut. <laughs> okay, so now really I don't that. know. I wasn't Australian at all. <laughs> oh, my God. Do you like an angry, uh, like a German or Russian accent? You know, one of those languages that, or one of those accents that sounds super intense. It's just like, oh, she's a beauty. Oh, she's okay. Jeez, I'm so What's sorry. What's that? It's Scottish. Maybe. Okay, um, can okay. you just, I know you haven't published your research yet, but what would you say is the main difference between bananas that have crocodiles growing out of them and crocodiles that have bananas? Mm, yes, yes. Well, you'll see mm-hmm. bananas that have crocodiles growing out of them photosynthesize. Interesting. And crocodiles with bananas growing out of them devour souls. Wow, okay, that's pretty impressive. Uh, I've done a little bit of research into my own ancestry in biology, and I would say, too, that uh, one of us is higher in potassium. Which one? Read the thesis paper to find out. Can you imagine people getting as excited for thesis papers to come out as they do for, like, new books or new shows. <laughs> oh, man, I hear I hear new... Joel over at the University of Cambridge is about to release his thesis on the difference between banana gators and apple pandas. <laughs> hey, guys, have you seen the new trailer out for this thesis paper that's coming out? <laughs> it's amazing. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. We just finished episodes 106, 107, 108, and 109 of the anime. That means that the Straw Hats got to rain dinners, they charged in, and then some stuff happened, and now they're out of rain dinners, and they're chasing after a crocodile. To remind our fans, rain dinners is the casino owned by Crocodile the Hero. Yes. Do you, do you just want to do the rest of my job too while you're at it? No, that's why I left out the details. I said some stuff happened. If you you said some stuff happened, you'd be fired off this podcast. You'd be forced to watch One Piece on your own without our beautiful commentary on top of it. (laughs) That sounds horrible. I think, Curtis, Curtis, here's what happened. I took Joel's job by doing the intro, so he felt the need to take your job, so you're going to have to take my job? Which means you can only speak after we do a very hilarious uh, seance uh, joke that uh, okay. It's just still popular okay. with all the ladies. And the men's fisheye lens womp womp reference joke. Curtis, would you like to summarize these episodes for us? Let's do it. All right. So we've got... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that sounded like a sound bite from like a video game. Let's do it. <laughs> That's your fighting animation. We are having a hard time being on track this evening. I apologize. And I hope that our antics are amusing. You know, okay. So here's my thing. Where? So far, we have not uh, quite had very many people tell us whether they think that our format could use tweaking. We haven't heard anyone who says, I love the current format. If you guys at home or wherever you are, because podcasts are everywhere, I always need to remind myself of that. But if other people want us to be more goofy, we can do that, you know? So long as we end up talking about all the cool stuff from One Piece, that's, that's fine too. So, you know, Twitter's the best way to reach out to us. But... Back to you, Curtis. Yes, speaking of One Piece, that's the show we just watched, and I'm going to summarize the episodes we watched right now. Superb, you funky little cowboy. Uh, I don't know what that means. I just wanted to say it to you. Okay. Um, All right, so we've got Luffy. No, not Sanji. Luffy, Zoro, Nami, Usopp. 
They are together. They are running into this casino looking for Crocodile. Luffy decides, I'm going to find Crocodile Crocodile by yelling at the top of my lungs, Crocodile, where are you? I'm here to kick your ass. Nothing happens. So then, the three of them, minus Zoro, they start yelling also to try to find Crocodile and Vivi, which they only just realized that she's missing. They start running because I think security's coming after them. Security's coming after them. They're also excited to kick Crocodile's butt and Smoker's chasing them. Yeah, Smoker Mm -hmm. comes in and he's chasing them. So they're running and the security's like, what do we do? And they call Crocodile and Crocodile says, Send, uh, no, it's a um, um, Miss All Sunday, Sunday. Mm-hmm. who's apparently the manager legally of this establishment, so she yeah. has clout or whatever. Says, send them to the VIP room. So they go to the VIP room, they run down this hall, um, and then there's a sign that says, VIPs to the left, pirates to the right. So Luffy, being like, I'm not a VIP, I'm a pirate, goes to the right. It's a dead end with a trap door, and they all fall, and they end up in a cage. The cage is made out of a material... That is called... Sea Prism Stone or Karyoseki, which okay. is the Japanese for it. All right. Karyoseki, I like that. Okay. So, it's made out of Karyoseki, and it mimics the effects of the ocean on Devil Fruit users who touch it. Mm-hmm. Really quick interjection. This has nothing to do with the summary, and I don't think that we have any more information to go off of at this point, but it comes from, quote unquote, a certain island in a certain sea, whatever that means. Back to you. And we all know that the word certain is never used with any meaning in one piece. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, so now they're trapped, and then Crocodile's there, and then eventually Vivi shows up because she gets captured by Miss All Sunday. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm glossing over that part, but there's a little battle involved, but yeah. Um, so now they're all in this room, right? We've got uh, four of the straw, five County VV of the Straw Hats. Mm-hmm. So well, four of them are in a cage, one of them is out. Yes. Um, the only people who aren't there are Sanji and Chopper. Uh, we've got Crocodile, Miss All Sunday, and then also in the cage with the four Straw Hats in there is Smoker. Yes. All right, so that's the layout. And, uh, not Smoker, uh, Crocodile starts to explain his plan and what they do in the show is basically he ex- his explaining the plan is just us watching it unfold. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we see a fake King Cobra huh? show up in Nanohana. Mr. Two using his clone clone fruit. Yes, exactly. Um, saying, hey, yes, it was me. I used dance powder. I stole all of your rain. I'm here to apologize, but I don't feel bad about it. <laughs> You guys have to understand that you are worthless because I'm the king. It's my divine right to have all this water. He pulled a sorry, not sorry on us. Mm -hmm. Go on. (laughs) Which is exactly the sort of thing someone like Mr. Two would do in his own life. I just want to say that. Mm -hmm. Also, quick aside, he accidentally almost calls himself the queen of the country, and then he corrects himself to the king. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Um, Then... uh, Mr. One and his counterpart, whose name I forgot. Double Finger. Double Miss Double Finger. Yeah, that's right. The the the, the New Year's person. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, Thank you, Oda. Yes. Uh, they show up with a giant ship that crashes into the city. Uh huh. Um, so now we've got like a bunch of inf- an inflamed populace, and um, Koza. Leader, Koza. Yes. Thank you. Koza, the leader of the rebellion, shows up. And he gets shot by the guard, doesn't really... I mean, he's shot, he's injured, he's okay, though. Um, not... I guess... He's alive. He, yeah, it's not a fatal shot. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and there's a... But he gets all the rebels together. They get weapons from the ship that just happened to be an armory ship. What a coincidence. Yeah. And then they charge to Alabarna. 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 Yes, okay. Alubarna. Alubarna? Yeah. It's like Alabasta, but not. It's Alu but is it Alu or Alu? Alu. Okay. Alu. 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 Alu Barna. Alu Barna. Um, they're going up there. The king is missing, but the city guard or the the, the king guard. Uh huh. Uh, Chaka. Yeah, is the well, one you're thinking of. Well, yeah, there's there's Chaka, and then like the actual like people, mm-hmm. the, the the foot soldiers. They're like, okay, the king's not here, but we're gonna defend 
even though he's not here. Yeah, we got to do what we assume he would tell us to do if he were here. Chaka had a moment of personal struggle where he was like, have I been fighting for the king for nothing? Is he actually a bastard? And then he decided he had to defend the king anyway. Mm-hmm. Don't expect closure on that. I'm pretty sure you just get like a moment where he was like, oh no, that wasn't me. It was a fake me. And then Chaka's like, okay, cool. Resolved. Um, so we are now about halfway through my summary. I apologize, this one's a little more detailed because a lot of stuff happened in this one. Unlike the last episode, well, I guess the last one was the movie and the, yeah, so it doesn't, you know what I mean. Okay. You are such a poet with words. Yes. You must, you must seduce women, or men, by the hour. I, I seduce many, many creatures. <laughs> <laughs> come here, llama. I don't know why llama was the first one to come to mind. Curtis, is that the weirdest thing you've ever said on this podcast? I think it might be. I, do you think so? I, I feel I, like I've said weirder. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of it got edited out, but this surely will stay in. Oh, great. Okay. Um, okay. So, we cut back now to Crocodile. And everyone's like, that was a ho-, you know, that sounds ho- so horrible. How could you do this? Um, Vivi's upset, Luffy's upset, um, then Crocodile's like, all right, well, I, my plan's unfolding, I'm just gonna leave you guys here, and you're all gonna die. Uh, what he does is he gives Vivi an option, it's like, if you want to try to escape and go to Aluvarna and <laughs> end all this, you can, uh, which we find out later, what he was gonna kill her no matter what, um, or, here's the key, you can get your friends out of this cage. Let's just drop... I'm going to drop the key right here on the floor. No, he didn't say he was going to. He just went, oops, clumsy me. And just drops it through a trap door into the aquarium area we've already seen for um, where Mr. Three got eaten. Yeah. Uh, and the key gets eaten by one of the banana gators. Yes. Which I think we've already... It's already been hinted, but these things are massive. These are apex predators mm-hmm. that apparently hunt sea kings. Yes. So they're strong. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to ride one. Oh, uh, obviously. Just into battle. I, I think anybody would. Would the banana be the perfect yeah. bit that oh, you could man. use to <laughs> lead? What do you call that? Yeah. I don't know, horse things. Yeah, no, like like the reins on a mm-hmm. horse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just want to say, I really love crocodiles, like the animal, okay. outside of this podcast in the real world. So, the banana gators are alligators, they're not crocodiles, but they're still close to my heart. See. Well, you 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 do know enough to actually know the difference between a crocodile and an alligator, which not everyone is familiar with. Right, of course. The difference being that alligators shoot lasers from their eyes, and crocodiles, the laser comes out of their mouth. Crocodiles will lend you money, but they're not. They'll never continue your friend, and they will have a high steep uh, interest rate. Whereas alligators, uh, once you've made friends with them, they they give you hugs. They're very warm and friendly, and you know what? Have some of their cash. It's okay. You're obviously down on your luck. And let's not even get into caimans, because those are some shifty bastards. Back to the summary, Curtis. Yes, because otherwise we're going to go down a rabbit hole. Welcome to to King of the What Now, where we talk about uh, animals at the top of their food chain, the king of their regions. King of the What Now? Yeah. Um, Okay. So, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. So Crocodile dropped the key, and now it's it's been, it's in the stomach of a banana gator. Mm -hmm. And the room's filling with water. Oh, yes, he also does that, and then he leaves. So Vivi is going to stay there and try to get the, well, try to save her friends, even though she can't get the key. Uh, another banana gator comes up. I guess all the banana gators are in a line now to come in and eat them. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's like, well, I can't fight this thing. And it's trying to eat her, but she eventually escapes and she gets out and she's going to look for Sanji, who is going by code main, name Mr. Prince now. And the reason she knows that he is nearby and looking to help is because he calls a crocodile on a... Um, transponder snail. Thank you. It's transponder snail. Or a dead, dead mushi. I'm going to stick with transponder snail on this one. And um, and he does the whole, like, hi, this is the, the damn restaurant. Or the ca- <laughs> the shitty restaurant or whatever you yeah. call it. <laughs> and, um, and he's like, I'm going to come save my friends, right? Crocodile leaves. He thinks that uh, Sanji has been captured because that's how it ends. It turns out Sanji actually just beat someone up and made him say to the transponder snail, "Oh yeah, we caught him. He's right outside." So they leave, and then Sanji comes inside when they're di- while they're distracted. He comes in, he defeats the defeats a bunch of banana gators, finally defeats the one that has the key. 
Also inside that banana gator is Mr. Three. In a bowl of wax, of yes. course. He saved himself. Um, so he, uh, the, he tosses the key away because he doesn't want to help the Straw Hats. And they then persuade Mr. Three by Sanji beating him up, uh, to make a new key with his finger and unlock the door, which is a good thing because it turns out the key that Crocodile left was a fake key Mm -hmm. and only Crocodile had the real key this whole time. So what ends up happening now? They escape. They beat up a bunch of uh, banana gators because when Luffy and Zoro get out, they have all this pent up energy. So they just take out a bunch of banana gators, um, which is impressive considering how strong we just said they are. Mm -hmm. And then they all leave. So Crocodile finally gets back with Miss All Sunday and sees the room flooded, but the door is open and they're not in there dead. Mr. Three is unconscious with a note on his chest uh, taped to his shirt that says... Uh, I got you this time, alligator bastard, signed Mr. Prince, or something yeah. like that. And there's also one final detail about their escape that is uh, important, I think, especially uh, to Catherine's perspective, and that is the fact that Smoker was going to drown. Mm. Uh, he had no one in the Marines to save him, but right before Luffy kind of went under, he he shouted to Zoro, hey, we gotta save him! And so Zoro followed his captain's orders, mm-hmm. and there's a moment where it looks like maybe Smoker's going to arrest him, but then he, in a very Sundere way, goes, all right, I'll let you go this time. Yeah, so he, yeah, exactly. He tells him, he's like, you guys get off this one time, but not in the future. And so then they finally run away. So obviously next time they just save his life mm-hmm. again, right? It's just a one-to-one ratio. <laughs> Keep putting him in life-threatening situations. So we now have all the Straw Hats minus Chopper, who is going to get lured back to the Straw Hats because Sanji has uh, Nami put her perfume that he bought for her on. So mm-hmm. that, because... Uh, Chopper's nose is really good. They didn't say this explicitly. I implied it. I'm um, pretty sure that's what's going to happen. Yeah. And so now they're running out of town and they're heading for Alabama, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I should mention Chopper this whole time was part also helping to distract Crocodile by wearing a cloak and pretending to be Mr. Prince. He was running around yelling, I am Mr. Prince. And uh-huh. luring uh, Crocodile. Crocodile. And because they don't know what Crocodile's abilities are, they know that they have a pet. Um, according to Mr. Two, that's what he sees in Chopper's role as. But he doesn't know that Chopper has his amazing transforming power. And so oh, Chopper yeah. changes back into small form and Crocodile doesn't, he's still looking for a big Chopper. Yeah. That okay. was a pretty good summary. The one detail I would have included was that the reason they were able to identify which crocodile swallowed the key was oh, that yeah. Smoker recognized the sound of its roar. Yeah, he says something about, doesn't the growl of the third one sound like the growl of the one that ate the key? And there's even a scene of Luffy going, no, I can't hear it. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Smoker is just amazing. Mm-hmm. Also incredibly important to bring up. This is super important to the summary. None of this makes sense without it. There's a moment when Luffy realizes that basically there's no way to get out of the cage. And so instead of coming up with a plan, he decides to imitate Sanji. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. Usopp is about to do one for Zoro before Na- Nami kicks them. But it's just, it's Luffy with his uh, lips kind of stretched out a little bit and, oh, I need to light this cigarette. This is the kick of love or yeah, something like that. Not- who ate all the food? Yeah, who ate okay. the meat? <laughs> okay, absolutely wonderful. Fantastic. Positively ecstatic. Right, like for sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Joel's, Joel's uh, losing patience with us now. All right, so the uh, other thing that I think is rather interesting, we learned a couple of things about uh, Miss All Sunday in these episodes. So you did uh, say that there was a fight and you kind of skipped over it in the name of brevity. But essentially, there's these two, uh, I don't know what you would call them, but the King's Guardsmen who are in charge of the military. uh, They and Igaram are like the three highest ranking members in the government under the king. It's uh, Pell and Chaka. Yes. And Igaram was the third one. Chaka. Chaka with a C. Chaka, okay. Um, I don't know what their official position is, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't know if one of them's like the head of I, arms or whatever. I think they're just both like captains of the guard or something like that. Okay. My point is that one of them, Pell specifically, has eaten the bird bird fruit model falcon. Which is awesome. He shows up, his introductory scene in terms of actually doing something rather than just talking to the king is a falcon dive bombing the millions with twin machine guns in order to say Vivi. So cool. It was so metal. Mm-hmm. I think, I think, uh, he, metal might, Jesus he, might take, has... he might take over the metal handle from, um, from, from Zoro. Okay. But 
Miss All Sunday shows up, and it turns out that uh, even though in this show uh, we haven't had a lot of female representation in terms of physical strength, she's very confident that she can beat Pell. She uses the power of her fruit, which is the ability to make limbs bloom like flowers from her flower flower fruit to basically pin this dude's wings and his arms and just causes him to fall off the building and then she just yoinks and she takes mm-hmm. Vivi back to the base. But we found out the name of her fruit is officially the flower flower fruit. Which is, you know, really the obvious choice <laughs> for that name. I, I have a question. Yeah? So we get, we've talked in the past, not on mic, about how devil fruit powers work based off of the naming convention. I don't know if we want to talk about that on mic or not. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Continue, and I'll cut it out if it's... Okay, so I have, we've talked about this, and you've told me that it's somewhat based on their like imagination. Uh-huh. Um, that if you think that it should work, then it will work, sort more or less, right? Basically. With, with limitations, but... Mm-hmm. So she has the flower, flower fruit, and she uses that to make limbs flower out of people's body or out of anything, right? Uh-huh. Could she make other things appear like flowers? If she what do you mean? To? Like uh, she a gun? flowers appear like flowers? Or, you know, or like a gun? So we, I, or... I think what Joel meant when he mentioned the limit is the imagination thing, each fruit does a specific thing. Ace's fruit makes fire. Um, but... Ace is limited by ways that he can imagine how to use his fire. Like, he could put it into his legs for kicking, or he could put it into his fists for punching. What other creative things can Mm -hmm. he do there? So I don't think that he could just decide that the power of the flare flare fruit is it makes fire, but also ice. And I think that that's the same kind of thing with Robin. So I, as far as we've seen... In the manga and the anime, even with my future knowledge, my knowledge of what might happen later, we've only seen this ability be body parts. I don't think that she can make other things bloom. I don't know how useful that would be in battle to make flowers bloom and that sort of thing. Um, The answer, I'm just going to say it's not possible. I think that it it is limited to uh, her body that she can do this to. Okay. My question at this time when I was watching it is, can't she make ears and eyes appear places? Can't she, uh, I don't know, make little tiny fingers appear out of things? Like, that's really creepy. And What does it feel like when a hand is growing out of your neck? Can she feel what those fingers touch? I don't know. Read and find out. Watch and find out. Um, I have a theory now. Okay. I think what it is, is... He, the the names are of the fruit are something that the human humans had to come up with, right? I believe so. so. The fruit is some sort of like power of nature. Okay, let's say. I mean, even if there's some sort of divine element to it, let's let's just lump that into like it's it's not it's not human control, right? Okay, it's, it's, they exist. We had to give them a name. So our, the naming convention given to them might just be imperfect, right? So okay. this fruit allows you to grow body parts out of things. What should we call it? Flowers they call the it flower, flower fruit, just because somebody was like having a good, like having fun with it, mm-hmm. right? It, it's not that the fruit is flower, flower fruit, and so you can make anything flower. It's the fruit does this. Okay, we're getting the cause and the effect mixed up, basically. Yes. Uh, also, I will say that I believe there's a visual that you can see uh, many times when she uses her powers of an actual flower petal. And I don't know if those are real or imagined, but I think that might also help with the naming scheme. Also, I I might be wrong, so I'm not saying that I'm the absolute authority, but I believe I read somewhere that both Luffy and Miss All Sunday's fruit powers are based off of ones that Oda himself thought would be useful to have. He wished that he could grab something from across the room, <laughs> so he came up with the, the oh, rubber okay. stretchy powers, and he wishes that he could have extra hands to draw panels faster, and that's where he came up with Miss All Sunday's fruit. I don't remember the source of that. Mm-hmm. I think it was a YouTube video, but that's that's what I heard. The other thing we learned about Miss All Sunday from Smoker is that she has a bounty of 70 million, uh, more, uh, 40 million more than Luffy's, and just 10 million shy of Crocodile. And as mm-hmm. we have seen, uh, that appears to roughly correlate to power. And so do you think that there's anything to this other than her devil fruit? Do you think it's the devil fruit that gave her the bounty, or is there something else that's going on here? So you're asking me how I think she got her bounty, correct? Yes. I think... She stole all the Sundays. 
Oh. And that's how she got her name. So she stole one seventh of the year. Okay. So now we've gotten the silly answer out of the way. Where do you think she actually got her bounty oh, from? Do you have any ideas? That was the only... I, I only have silly answers. Okay. That's um, fair. I, okay. Let me think. Okay. I think... See, I don't think I had this one. Here's the thing about bounties, right? It either came from something she did, uh, someone she hurt, or something that she was involved in. Like, if she were a member of Crocodile's crew before he was a warlord mm-hmm. and they were rampaging together. So, with those answers in mind, where where are you leaning? Also, I'll give you a really quick hint that I don't believe anyone in Baroque Works is from Crocodile's time as a pirate. I, w- I was going to say, I don't think that Miss All Sunday was a part of Crocodile's crew, <laughs> so it can't be from association with him. Because at I, by the time she's affiliated with with Crocodile, Crocodile is a seven one of the seven warlords of the sea. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Though I do find it interesting that she's allowed to manage the um the 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 casino. Oh, okay. Because she, if she has a bounty on her head, like Crocodiles get scrubbed when he becomes one of the warlords of the sea. Uh huh. Does anybody else's get scrubbed if he's that they're working for? Him? Not okay. So this might be spoilers, but since it's never explicitly brought up, I believe that when you become a warlord of the sea, you are given certain rights. I believe that Crocodile basically said, "Give me this casino in Alabasta," and I I think that the government agreed. And then I also think that he may have said, "She's working with me. Please don't take her in. She she helps." Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's possible that no one's recognized her, even though seventy million is a fairly high bounty this early in the series, and so yeah. you'd think that someone would recognize her. All right, Chris, I'm going to give you one more hint. And also, just to clarify, at this point, you don't have enough information to guess. There's more to Miss All Sunday that we're going to get as the story progresses, much like how we're going to learn a little bit more about Crocodile. But Joel, what will our fa- fans think if I don't come up with the exact right answer? It's true. They're actually going to call for your resignation immediately, so you mm-hmm. better put a lot of thought into this. All right, the next clue that I'm going to give you is that, much like how Buggy is apparently called Buggy the Immortal, even though we've never seen that, and Kuro is Kuro of the Thousand Plans, Robin, on her wanted poster, is known as Demon Child. Hmm. That's interesting. Honestly, sounds to me uh, like she was in a band, like a screamo band. <laughs> <laughs> Music is illegal in the One Piece. Band. No, she was inciting riots and stuff with her screamo. I think what happened is she got her devil fruit power young. Okay. And was having a hard time figuring out exactly how to use and control it. Okay. And probably caused a lot of chaos in the town. And scared okay. A lot of people. Gotcha. She made a hand appear in someone's throat and they couldn't breathe and then they just died. And to the outsiders who didn't know she had a devil fruit, it looked like they literally just died as she walked past. Mm. There you go. She made a hand appear and it flipped someone off and that was so offensive mm-hmm. that they were just like, let's arrest this a-hole child. <laughs> yeah. Actually, here's another idea. She made her hand appear such that a bunny shadow figure appeared, and people thought that the bunny oh. was was evil, and so they had to mm-hmm. find the person who created it. I think between the side effect of her practicing and the natural horror of seeing body parts suddenly appear out of nowhere, I think that's what got her bounty. Okay, I gotcha. That makes perfect sense. All right, Curtis, that was just all of the observations I had about Miss All Sunday. As I said, we're going to get a little bit more about her. I mean, she is the highest ranking female agent in this yeah. criminal organization. Was there anything from these episodes that uh, you thought was particularly interesting? Yeah, so I noticed when we were go- when we were watching, they were all stuck in the cage, right? So Luffy didn't try to escape, which was stupid. And uh, Smoker didn't try to escape, which is also stupid, because both of them probably could have gotten through the holes in the cage. Um, well, maybe not Luffy, probably couldn't have fit through it. But, uh, anyways, I he also saw... stretched his fist through the hole to punch Crocodile in the face. Yeah, exactly. Zoro, we've seen cut very tough things before. And my initial thought was, why doesn't Zoro cut the cage open? He's cut through boulders before. He should be able to cut through the cage. And it was pointed out both by you and then also later by the show, uh, <laughs> that the metal that the... The, the, I what it's called, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, 
that the cage is made out of is also super strong. So, like, when one of the uh, banana gators went to bite it, it broke all of its teeth. Yes. So, Zoro even makes a comment, if only I could cut through this, I could get us out of here. So, I have a theory that in the future, he will find a way to cut through it so that this will never happen again. Interesting. Well, and this is the second or third time recently that Zoro has said, man, if only I were strong enough that I could cut through hard things. Yeah, you'll remember that he couldn't get out of the wax from the position, and the very next scene we saw him in of significant... uh, value note. Anyways, uh, he was saying, if only I'd been stronger. So, maybe. Uh, yeah. He seems to be whif- lifting some really big weights, so I wonder if right now he's thinking, I wonder if it's just a matter of brute force. If in the One Piece universe you can grow strong enough to mm. cut through that sort of thing. Okay, so Luffy's techniques and Zoro's techniques, Luffy has a really searchy body and he can learn to kind of like twist it and maneuver it in kind of unique ways. He might be able to figure out how to grab things from a distance and use that as an attack. And I think I've already asked this question before, but can you see like an anime-specific ability that Zoro might be able to get? Would 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 sword beams be able to cut through the Karaseki? Would that help? You know, I was thinking about this and I was trying to think about it within like anime law or Specifically, One Piece logic, right? Uh huh. Because um, I don't know. Okay. I, I we've seen. I'm trying to think of how we've seen him use his sword ability before. Has he ever cut like an energy wave out or anything? Uh, no, I don't think that we've seen anything like that. The closest is Dragon Twister, which makes a big whirlwind of air. But that's air. But yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the closest, and mm-hmm. it's not close. I don't know. I. As far as we are in the series, the only people I've seen do, like, extra human things are Devil Fruit users. Huh. And so, I guess until I see something else, something different, I don't have any any evidence to base anything on. And I, you don't think that Zoro could eat a Devil Fruit that would somehow enhance his sword-cutting he, abilities? He could. I don't know if he would, though. Okay. Um... I know for sure Sanji wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Because Sanji made, in one of these episodes, he made a comment that what what sort of pirate would eat a devil fruit if it does if it makes you incapable of swimming? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's also an advantage to them not having too many devil fruit users on the crew, huh? Because the more people who can swim, the better. Absolutely, I will say this. Uh, all right, count this as minor spoilers. You're later going to meet crews of pirates that are obsessed with the idea of having multiple, uh, not multiple devil fruits, but many users of different fruits. Mm-hmm. And they seem to think that, oh yeah, if we just had someone like Ace who could create fire, if we had someone like Smoker who was made out of smoke, we'd be invincible. Yeah. Since this arc is kind of leading up to Luffy fighting Crocodile, and it's going to be very boring if he can't land a single punch, maybe there are weaknesses to devil fruits or that sort of thing. But... Um, it's interesting because I don't think that that is Luffy's definition of strength, and I don't think the members of his crew really see it as that way either. Also, I think, uh, narratively, or, uh, meta, uh, in the meta, I think Oda's thing is trying to make the crew as weird as possible, and I think Zoro's already weird enough with three swords and and the inability to direct himself. Yeah. I've got a question for you along those lines, Joel. Mm -hmm. Do you think if... Luffy had set out to see knowing what devil fruits were, do you think he still would have eaten one or do you think he would have refused on principle at that point? Like, the only reason he ate the gum gum fruit is he because didn't know what it, was. it was food and it was there. I don't think that he would intentionally eat a devil fruit uh, because he he talked about how great of a swimmer that he was. At the same time, a lot of Luffy's fights are won not because necessarily he's physically strong and capable of punching, but he has a lot of creative ways that he uses his power. I don't know if Luffy would be able to win the battles that he's been in if he didn't have the ability to add the extra momentum of stretching his arm and using the, the spring energy or whatever it's called in physics, but... I've often wondered how that story would turn out if he mm-hmm. hadn't eaten the devil fruit. I think he's pretty reliant on it. Mm-hmm. But he's also had it since he was very young. Yeah. I don't know. I think it would be cool to know. I don't think we ever will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We could ask Oda. It's a... Uh, and it, if this is spoilers, don't say anything. We haven't seen evidence of Shanks having devil fruit powers, right? We have not seen and, anything that really. I mean, that. he was swimming and he saved uh, Luffy, so at that time he didn't have any. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and he is... 
known, or at least we haven't seen him fight, but we know he's strong. Huh? So, and plus, I mean, I also I guess we also have Sanji and Zoro. So, I mean, it's it's possible that Luffy could have become very strong without it. Mm-hmm. But Just, I, yeah, I I agree. His fighting his fighting technique would be very different. <laughs> yeah, it's use what you have at the table, and he has strength mm-hmm. power, so he's figured it out. Now, Catherine, I believe that you also wanted to talk about some things this episode. So what did you find most interesting about these four episodes? All right, so my favorite thing about these four episodes is it's the first time the crew has been able to interact face-to-face with Crocodile, really. Mm-hmm. And he is just such a bastard. Like, he keeps saying things that are making Luffy angrier and angrier. And I mentioned this on Twitter while we were watching, but if he had just been a little less of a bastard, Luffy might not have wanted to punch him as much as he wants to punch him now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Although he still wanted to punch him a lot because of what he was doing to the country. So maybe that's a moot point. But like... The the sarcasm and the smugness that he puts into his words as he talks about accidentally dropping the key is just fantastic. Villain of the year. As I've pointed out before, I'm pretty sure that, well, one of the themes of One Piece, from my analysis of it, is the idea that Luffy and his crew are fairly young. Uh, so far, all the ones that we've met, Chopper, by the way, is canonically 15, I saw in the wiki earlier. Oh, wow. So they're all very young. None Mm -hmm. of them are older than 20. And they're going up against pirates that have been pirates for many, many years. I don't know Crocodile's exact age. I'm sure I could wiki it and figure it out. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea that Crocodile doesn't see Luffy as a threat is just, he's just this young kid who's running around. It's like when a kid's going to be like, I'm going to grow up and become president. Sure you are, Timmy. You're eight. Let's see. (laughs) Let's see how your life progresses in the next 27 years. Can I take us on a very short tangent? Has to be short, but okay. So when you say Chopper is 15 years old, he's a reindeer that ate the human human fruit. Uh-huh. Is his lifespan based on that of a reindeer or a human? Because if he's 15... Wouldn't you like to know? Yeah. Wouldn't you like to know? I... Old man Chopper coming 2020. Well, 15 years for a reindeer is actually pretty old, He I was think. like a two-year-old reindeer when yeah. he ate his devil fruit. Okay. So I, I... Okay. So he's probably like 15 years, like, equivalent age human-wise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, also, Crocodile is 44, not that it was super relevant, but okay. now we know. He is an old man, and he's tired of the world's bullshit. Hey, we- 40 is not old. The other thing about Crocodile being a bastard, he... There was the old man who was digging up water in Yuba. Koza's dad, Toto. Yes, I remembered. Good job. He blesses the rains down in Africa. I'm not apologizing for that reference joke. Everyone will think it's funny. Down in Alabasta. <laughs> I got more of a laugh than it should have. <laughs> well, I'm just imagining the song. Anyway, it's not important. This isn't a music podcast. Um, or is it? Curtis? I'm sorry. It's hard for me to put my thoughts in a row, and every time you interrupt me, I have to start the process over again. Okay. Sorry. Okay. It's okay. So, there's this old man, and his dream is very closely attached to the water. That's why Luffy was defending the water so vigorously. So every time the old man finds water, Crocodile's targeting him with sandstorms. And on one hand, that is for uh, logistical reasons, right? He doesn't want him to be able to bring the Oasis back. He doesn't want uh, Yuba to rise again. But on the other hand, I think it's just Crocodile being a bastard. I think he's personally offended by people who have dreams because he's kind of a grizzled old man and he doesn't have dreams anymore. Mm -hmm. And so he's going after that old man just to kind of spit in his face and be like, screw you and your dreams. And that is very antithetical to Luffy as a character. Okay, I'm going to talk big picture for a second. I don't think I need to explain that sometimes we play hard and fast with uh, spoilers because I've given that uh, apology so many times. Arlong showed up at the beginning of his arc, and he hated humans with a passion. And you go, wow, who hurt you? Eventually, in 900 episodes, we will get an episode where that kind of explains some aspect of the world, or some aspect of Arlong's past, or some aspect of something that makes you go, oh, that's that's why Arlong is so angry. That's who hurt you. That's who hurt you. Crocodile's bastardry... Mark my words, will have something to do with something about the world, where he's from, uh, who he knew, who he's lost, something like that. And 
even to this day, I, as someone who's read every chapter, don't know what it is. But I guarantee you that he's going to be the long-lost son of some country that was destroyed by its citizens. Or he had a wife who was killed because she believed in dreams. Something that makes him so angry yeah. at this man for trying to save the country. And he even said something about, uh, I hate fools who put their hope and faith in other people. Yikes. <laughs> who hurt you, man? Goodness, who hurt crocodile. you? <laughs> who hurt you? Um, but yeah, I actually have no guesses exactly what it is, but I wonder if, or not who it is, but like what hurt him, but I think it might be related to lacking military might, because he said earlier that he doesn't care about the money, he doesn't care about the mm -hmm. fame, what he cares about is military might, so someone shot someone, and he was like, if only I had a bigger gun. Mm -hmm. Which I'm sure comes up a lot in this world where there are very scary pirates running mm -hmm, around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but that was basically all I wanted to say about that. The other thing that I really liked from this episode is that it gave us more insight into Luffy's relationship with Smoker and how he views Smoker. I get the impression from Luffy both as a person who has seen the whole series and as a person who is re-watching the series now that he sees anybody who is not explicitly an enemy or explicitly a bad guy, as a friend. So he and Smoker had a bonding moment together in that cage. Smoker's a friend now, and he has adopted him. And he's not necessarily going to be best friends with him. Smoker's not Nakama, but he's not going to let him die. He's mm -hmm. not a bad enough person to allow that. Well, and we even know that Luffy doesn't believe in killing his enemies. Uh, we, we had a scene where Vivi had the chance to attack Crocodile, and she used her peacock feather? Is that what she calls it? Peacock tip? She used her attack to basically try to decapitate him. And if he hadn't been made out of sand, that would have ended much differently but uh luffy wouldn't do that even if he had had the chance he would have just knocked him unconscious well and on that point you notice uh vivi when she's addressing a uh, crocodile says i am i am going to kill you mm -hmm. luffy only ever says i'm gonna beat your ass yep i'm gonna i'm gonna kick your butt and that's all he ever says he never says i'm gonna kill you i'm gonna end your life or anything like like anything along those lines no spoilers but i think that's very informed by his upbringing i think he thinks if i just gave this guy a good ass whooping he would see the error of his ways mm -hmm. well and as i've pointed out before a lot of the times in one piece the battles are more of an ideological one even the opponents that luffy beats even if they're still jerks or evil or whatever term you want to use they do, they are somewhat affected by Luffy because he, he fights with all of his heart on the line. And I think that's also why he, ins why he kind of respects Smoker to a certain degree. Well, he doesn't want to be friends with Smoker. Smoker will turn him in and that sucks. But if they're trapped and they can talk like Luffy doesn't see any reason not to, because Smoker is a man who lives by his ideals, whereas Crocodile has no ideals. His ideals are just, I'm going to hurt other people. And Luffy's like, how dare? His ideals are, ideals are dumb. <laughs> exactly. Get a military instead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why have feelings when you can have guns? I love that. I want it on a t-shirt. I want it on 10 t-shirts. Okay, we'll sell it and we'll come in. We're all at the same time. <laughs> Perfect. All right, and we haven't talked about our sponsor yet this week. And so this week's sponsor is, again, someone new. We like to keep it uh, mixed up a little bit. You know, we don't bring back old sponsors a lot of the time. And what we have this week is the world's comfiest chair. That's right. You've had comfy chairs before. You've probably had a lot of bad chairs that weren't very comfy. But this is the ultimate chair of ultimate luxury and ultimate comfort. That's a lot of ultimates. Now, Catherine, you were approached by this company uh, specifically. Uh, what can you say about this product that they're offering today? Oh, man. Okay, so let me tell you guys, I love soft things, and this chair is the softest thing. I love squishy things, and this chair is the squishiest thing. I can sit in it and read a book. I can sit in it and drink a cup of tea. I can sit in it and hold my cat. It's perfect for all of my chair-related needs. Not only that, but it comes with a convenient snake pouch for your snake friends. Joel, you have a snake friend. Yes, yes. Uh, they've, they've become quite the rage these days. Uh, you know, there wasn't a time too long ago when the big thing was cats or dogs. But, you know, a dog's loyalty and a cat's... Uh, playfulness if it's a kitten or it's a, uh, you know... Snuggliness. A snuggliness it's, it's if it's a snuggly kitten. It's begrudging need to stay around so you can keep feeding it. Look, there's a lot of different types of cats. What I'm saying is that cats are great. We here love uh, cats, Catherine and I in our household. And, uh, you know, cats are great. Dogs are great. Gerbils, uh, axolotls, whatever. 
But snakes are really where it's at when you think about it. You know, no one gives a better snug than a snake. Yeah, they're just, they're everywhere. Curtis, you've let snakes into your heart recently. Have you found that you're more comfortable having done so? Yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, having, having snakes around is a real confidence booster. Um, they, they, uh, they make you feel good about yourself. They always give you this look with their eyes that <laughs> just is like, you know... You are worth something. And yeah. It's, it's really nice. And I mean, the closer you look into those eyes, the more comfortable you feel, you know? And it's just, you want them in your life all the time, and you want to tell all of your friends mm-hmm. about your wonderful snakes. But we're not here to talk about the wonderful, beautiful, majestic snakes that uh, live in our hearts and live in our houses. We're here to talk about the world's most comfiest chair. Chris, we gave you a spin yeah. on it for about an hour earlier. Yeah, you know, the thing I like about it, um, so I was reading the manual while, while I was sitting in it, right? Of course, always read and, the manual. Yeah, um, is uh, So not only is it soft, but it still gives you the support where you need it, right? And, like you know, like on your back and that, like, you know, like it's got good lumbar support and that. And it's it's uh, been highly engineered by former scientists who quite didn't quite make it into NASA, but we're like NASA adjacent, right? So it's a, uh, it's you know, you know that it means it's the top of the line because I mean, really, if you think about it, these are guys that NASA couldn't even get and comfiest mm-hmm. world's comfiest chair, they got them. I don't know about you, but I like all my furniture to come from NASA adjacent folk. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just when I think about it, I'm like, I sit down in this chair, I could be going into space right now. <laughs> now. We've talked about many different sponsors on the show, and as we know, magic is a real thing that is starting to become more and more prevalent in the various industries. I tried to look into the world's comfiest chair. I thought maybe there was sorcery going on. Maybe it wasn't actually that comfortable, and it was some kind of, like, I don't know, hypnosis or something. No, it's it's totally legitimate. It's all 100% science. Probably science beyond your level of understanding mm-hmm. for the common person, but no, it's it's absolutely wonderful. I've actually taken a sleeping on the world's comfiest ca- or chair compared to sleeping in the bed, for example, because yeah. it's just so good. Well, and you can do that for a long time because they've built things in to massage your muscles to help prevent atrophy. So mm-hmm, you can, mm-hmm. you, I think they've rated it up to like a month now. Wow. Um, and the next model is going to be a year. So you could stay in your the world's comfiest chair for a whole year um they you still have to unfortunately right now you have to get up to use the bathroom unless you want to take you know uh, extreme measures on in, you on know borrow side. some equipment from the local hospital i gotcha yeah, yeah but uh they are working on the the year-long model will have a lot of those features built in so you just don't even have to get out of your chair wow that's incredible so go to the world's comfiest chair uh people and let them know that cotwin sent you and now you can enjoy all of your anime video games tv everything that you could possibly want from the world's comfiest chair remember if it's not the world's comfiest chair What are you even doing sitting on it? Yeah, get off of that thing. All right, and we are back to the uh, talking about the episodes. I have just one last thing that I wanted to talk about. And that, well, okay, two things. One of them is going to be a very short thing. Crocodile's eyes, when he gets angry, are incredible. Uh, He has this very reptilian look. Uh, Maybe it could be also a little, you could consider it as cat-like. But he gets progressively angrier with the Straw Hat Pirates and the way that they keep undermining him. And it's really good. I don't think we've ever seen a character, not even Kuro and Don Krieg, I think, and Arlong had moments where they got really angry, but I don't think that it's been drawn quite as well as this. I think mm-hmm. Oda's uh, drawing style really comes out in Crocodile's angry eyes. Second thing, can we all just agree that Sandy's MVP for these four episodes? Yeah. It is... I've been in his corner since day one, but that's partially because your day one, Curtis, was actually my day however many, and so I've had mm-hmm. many experiences with Sandy. I've enjoyed his humor and his, his machoism and all this other stuff, and this was one of the moments when I first fell in love with this character. He had a moment in this that was like a, a casino heist. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, got, they got a crocodile and Miss All Sunday to leave, and Vivi is trying to get out of the casino to go find Sanji. And then here's, oh, the bridge has collapsed, but we can't get out. And then she's like, oh, no, what am I going to do? And then she hears a voice nearby say, well, I collapsed the bridge, not so people can't get out, but so they can't get back in. <laughs> and she turns, and at the slot machine, sitting here smoking a cigarette with some sunglasses on, is Sanji just kind of like 
acting chill, you know, in a suit and all of that. It and was he perfect. looks so good. Yeah. Those sunglasses mm-hmm. are just the perfect touch on top of the suave cake. Yeah, I, they do as much as they... Oda does whatever he can to make all of the straw hats look good. They might have different body types. For example, Chopper. Uh, other characters we meet in the future might also not quite be exactly your typical definition of handsome or beautiful. Um, Also look at Usopp. But they put a lot of effort into making sure that they look pretty good in what they wear. But Sanji, I would say, is the most stereotypically handsome of the Straw Hat men. And he, the glasses are a good look for him. He sports that in a lot of the movies as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, A plus, Oda. Good job. Good job. And just the fact that Crocodile is the man who seems to have this big complex plan. He's going to destroy the country, and he's deprived them of water, and he's framed the king, and he has the clone clone fruit, yada, yada, yada. And even so, Sanji manages to get around it by pretending that he was captured on the Denden Mushi by using Chopper as a... It's just wonderful. I love Sanji. And okay. And now, Catherine, I have one quote here that you wanted me to bring up, and that was Smoker saying that Luffy's an idiot, that he's stupid. And Zoro, very calmly, I think he just got woken up from a nap by Nami while he was captured. He says, yes, he's very stupid, but he's our captain because he's so stupid. Now, why did that line uh, strike such a chord with you? I just, we don't get a lot verbally from Zoro about how he feels about Luffy. And so I think this idea that he follows Luffy because Luffy's an idiot is really interesting. And I think at its core, what he actually means is Luffy is so stupid that he does things nobody else would do. Mm-hmm. He's much more bold than he should be in his position. And he's going to fight Crocodile, and if he dies, he flippin' dies. And Zoro mm-hmm. likes that mm-hmm. attitude. And that that's... Uh, so... I think they said it slightly differently, but that's how I read it still. Yes. Was like, I, th- I think what it was, like, the way I remember it was, uh, was, um, Smoker said, you know, he's stupid because Luffy was, ke- like, he was so upset he kept going up and touching the, uh, trying <laughs> the to get out the bars. <laughs> and if he yeah. touched the bars, he'd get weak because it's like he's in the ocean. And then he would get up and do it again. Um, and then I thought Zoro just said, like, yes, but that's why he's our captain. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily, specifically saying because he's stupid but the way he's acting right now is why it's our the captain, tenacity. right like mm-hmm. yeah but it's like the same the the same like emotion behind it or the same thoughts i had this thought earlier today and if you guys don't have anything more to say i think i'd like this to be the final thought that we sign off with is that all right I don't sure. have any final thoughts. Uh, okay, well, it, I just, I don't want to be the tyrannical captain. I want to be the captain who has the support of his crewmates. Are we taking votes now? I mean, sure. Yeah, basically. Um, don't say anything stupid and ruin this for me. Okay. God dang it, Curtis! No! I'm taking it back. I'm going to be tyrannical. You just said something, in, you said something incredibly stupid with the way your eyes looked at me. How dare you! Okay. Here's a thought that I had this morning, and it's kind of a big picture. If you think about all of the characters that we've had so far on the Straw Hat crew, uh, Luffy became a great, well, not became a great pirate, but he decided he wanted to become a great pirate, as far as we can tell, because of Shanks' influence. He has the hat, the hat's important to him. Uh, We have Zoro, whose childhood friend died and said, become the world's greatest swordsman, one of us, and because she died, Zoro now has to become that person. Uh, Sanji has, he's learned a lot from Zeph, and uh, I mean, very minor spoilers, but we're going to get future flashbacks that show even more of Zeph's influence on uh, Nami's mom, Bellamere, her last words were, you know, be happy or, or go on adventures and whatever. And Usopp was told by his mom to go out and, and have great adventures. And Chopper was heavily influenced by... And not only that, but Gold Roger did that same thing. Gold D. Roger. Sorry, I don't want to dead name him. Gold D. Roger inspired people with his last words. He went up on the gallows and he said, hey, you want my treasure? Go and find it. Ever since, pirates from all over the world have set sail for the treasure that will make their dreams come true. It's kind of campy to quote the show, but the reason it's quoted so often is because the whole... One of the things that makes One Piece so great, one of the things that make me go, One Piece is better than any other bit of literature or fiction that I've ever read, is it has these powerful themes that just show up in all these different ways... Luffy's incredibleness as a captain, the way he's able to convince the other members of his crew to join him, the way he's now influencing Kobe and Smoker through his actions, the way that uh, when Buggy shows up again, his his outlook has changed just a little tiny bit. Alveda's changed just a little tiny bit. 
is because Luffy is doing with his life what all these other characters did, all these figures did with their deaths. Gold Roger died getting people to go out and become pirates. Nami's mom died telling Nami to to be to go on adventures. Usopp's mom died saying, be this great pirate. Luffy is saying, be a great pirate now. Go on great adventures with me. We're going to do it. We are going to win. And it's just incredible. And I was thinking about this this morning before we watched all these episodes, but now that we watched this episode and Zoro brought up the thing... Wow, full circle. It just it 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 it's really powerful. Mm-hmm. So that's that's all I wanted to say. That was a very good final thought. Thank you very much. It was a very good do 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 final thought. Outro goes here. In this episode, I award the badge of questioning to myself. Does Miss All Sunday have to water the body parts to get them to grow? Imagine a little lung of flowers. <laughs> like little tiny <laughs> hands. <laughs> So ends the next leg of the King of the What Now adventure. We're sad to see you go, but we'll be here next week. If you crave some social interaction with us in the meantime, you can find us on all sorts of different media. We have Gmail, Patreon, and Tumblr. All of those are King of the What Pod. King of the What Pod at gmail.com, patreon.com slash King of the What Pod kingofthewhatpod.tumblr.com. Our Twitter handlers are a little bit different. You can reach me at k-o-t-w-n underscore pod. And you can contact me, Curtis, at Pirate Co-host. Also, please take a moment to rate and review our podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen. Not only will this help others find the podcast, but your constructive feedback will help us improve the show as we go. Thanks so much for giving us a listen. Until next time, follow your dreams and protect your treasure. Remember, it doesn't need to be literal treasure.